Come on in. Welcome to Idled Out, where we talk all things Survivor. My name is Luke, and today we're talking about the most blatant jury pandering in Survivor history. Jury pandering comes in many forms, but I would define it as an action with the express goal of gaining one or more players' jury votes. And whether they admit to it or not, every Survivor player does it. Perhaps it comes in the form of playing an overly diplomatic game. Or maybe it's giving someone a heads up that they're going home next. Maybe it's refusing to vote for someone even when you know they're going home. Or perhaps it's just good old fashioned butt kissing. Whatever form it takes, courtroom lawyers wish they could so blatantly butter up jurors. So today, I thought it would be fun to look at some of the most blatant jury pandering in Survivor history, both successful and unsuccessful, from final tribal answers that earned players' votes to rice negotiations that definitely didn't. So put your long-lost hat on, give up your spa reward, and join hands with your prayer warriors as we take a look at the most blatant jury pandering in Survivor history. At number six is everything Rick Devins did at Tribal Council in Survivor, Edge of Extinction. Yes, this video is supersized because I simply couldn't bear to cut any pandering for an audience as talented, smart, and attractive as all of you. The only non-finalist on this list, Rick had the jury eating out of the palm of his hand with his theatrical, over-the-top idol plays, constant immunity wins, and funny Tribal Council comments despite having little actual agency in the game proper. Despite being voted out on day 11, Rick re-entered the game via the Edge of Extinction battle back, but struggled to find his footing in the game at the merge. He wanted to play an aggressive game after getting new life, but was constantly left out of plans as the game happened around him. He was even a perennial target upon his re-entry into the game. And none of this really changed from the first merge boot to the last. Rick's plans rarely came to fruition. He hardly ever knew what was really going on, and he was constantly in the crosshairs. That doesn't sound like a Survivor winner, but Rick would have cleaned house had he gotten to the end, simply because of his theatrics at Tribal Council. Rick shamelessly pandered to the jury, his constant immunity wins and immunity idols giving him safety to speak openly about what he saw about the tribe dynamics. Most importantly, he absolutely made a meal out of every single idol play, and the jury was lapping it up. Julie's proven time and time again that she loves lying to people's faces. <laughs> so I would like to play this hidden immunity idol for myself. You guys are gems. Rick had no agency in the game, and that didn't matter. If anything, his constant immunities and showboaty idol plays made the other players in the game look asleep at the wheel. The jury swallowed every funny Rick comment, theatrical idol play, and clutch immunity win, like Tony eating a pizza. You're really not even gonna bother chewing. At number five is Todd's final tribal answer to Jean Robert in Survivor China. Todd was an expert at telling each member of the jury exactly what they wanted to hear and exactly how they wanted to hear it. But his answer to Jean Robert is a Hall of Famer when it comes to flattery. In China, Jean Robert considered himself a master strategist, the kingpin of the game, a bad boy, if you will, and not at all a bell end, as his last name would imply. At final nine, Jean Robert begins putting in motion what he thinks will be the move of the game a blindside on James. He loops in Todd on his plan, but unfortunately for Jean Robert, his logic in bringing Todd in on this plan is as blurry as his pubes. Todd is upset that Jean Robert has evolved from snoring walrus to thinking human, so he blindsides Jean Robert out of the game and saves James for another day. Fast forward to Final Tribal, and Jean Robert asks Todd why he voted him out when the optimal play for their alliance would have been to take out James. When you had approached me about blindsiding James, I was like, oh no, he's catching up. So who then becomes the biggest threat to me? You. 
What do I have to do? Turn it around on you, who is an extremely great strategic player in your daily life. I had to get rid of my biggest strategic threat, who is you. There's a kernel of truth to what Todd is saying. Jean Robert had no social capital, but his read on the game was good, and that was threatening to Todd. But where Todd excelled was knowing that Jean Robert didn't want an apology like Amanda gave him, or pushback like Courtney gave him. He wanted his ego stroked. And so Todd stroked harder than Spencer in the Cambodian rain. At number four is Yule giving Jonathan his hat back in Survivor, Cook Islands. Penner betrayed an impressive amount of people in the game, most of them twice, so it's no surprise that his time was running short by the final seven. At this point, Yule, Penner's only friend and ally in the game, decided to cut him loose. Penner's hat had significant sentimental value to him, so on his way out the door, he asked for his hat back. And I'd like my hat back at some point. Probably with little expectation that he'd ever see it again. You know, normally I'd be in favor of a fedora just disappearing forever, but Penner's just about the only guy to ever pull this look off. Ever the diplomat, Yule decides to bring Penner's hat back to him at the next tribal, putting the hat on Jonathan's seat on the jury bench. It's a small, kind gesture, but this made huge waves with the Cook Islands cast. I mean, what else are they going to talk about? At this point, this is now a tribe of four introverts, Parvati, and a guy who spent more time with his tongue in Candace's throat than out of it. Becky, Parvati, Adam, and even Jeff all call this out at Tribal for the pandering that it is, and Yule even admits that it serves a dual purpose both in trying to smooth over any bad blood between him and Jonathan, but also doing a kind thing for a friend. When it comes to winners, Yule was one of the most shameless jury panderers of all time, and this is one of many examples of Yule's constant jury management, something which Candace even heroically calls him out on at Final Tribal, though he disputes the word shameless. He pandered, but he had shame. We've just looked at several players whose jury pandering worked for them. Now let's look at the other side of the coin. At number three is Albert's constant compliments during Final Tribal in Survivor, South Pacific. I know he's from Florida, but Albert is like if Sash was from the West Coast. By Final Tribal, Albert had a reputation for being a bit of a sleazy, transparently diplomatic, used car salesman type who was always scrounging for Final Tribal votes like a raccoon in trash. He gave up his reward in episode 12 to Cochran, knowing Cochran was going home that night. He gave Dawn and Whitney false hope in the game that he might work with them. A charitable interpretation of his demeanor would be that he was just too nice for his own good. But personally, I think that he was, yeah, a nice guy, but also hustling for jury votes left, right, and center. In the game, Albert was endlessly complimentary to the other players, and he continues that streak to the bitter end, that final tribal. Only, this is not a jury that wanted compliments. These are some of the most bitter players in Survivor history, and they wanted a final tribal bloodbath. If anything, Albert might have stood a better chance at final tribal if he told them all he outplayed them and that they all suck. When Jim steps up to make his jury speech, he asks Albert to excoriate Sophie and Coach and say why they deserve to lose. But he warns him, if you give a compliment, you will lose my vote. You'll never guess what Albert does. <laughs> All right, I love this question. I love the way you approach the game. Um, specifically. <laughs> to the end, Albert was overly nice, but in a way that came off as inauthentic and sleazy, and he ultimately earned zero votes for his diplomacy against Blunt Sophie and cult leader Coach. I think there's a lesson in here. Never say nice things. At number two is... Well, everything Angelina did in the second half of Survivor David vs. Goliath, but specifically her getting rice for the tribe. At the final nine of David vs. Goliath, the camp is running low on rice, and Angelina decides to put that Yale MBA to good use to get more rice for the tribe. 
At immunity, she negotiates with Jeff and makes their starting offer. All of the fishing gear, the cookware, all of their chairs, their swing, and all of their remaining reward items for a sack of rice. Now, Jeff, this is our starting offer. We are desperate and we can go lower. You gotta wonder what is going on in the negotiations classes at Yale's MBA program. Do the professors just throw on an episode of Pawn Stars and call it a day? Anyway, Jeff is feeling generous, so he lets Angelina get away with the steal of the century. If one person sits out of the upcoming immunity challenge, they can have enough rice to get through the end of the game. Angelina offers herself as tribute in a self-described selfless act. I know, I know. You probably forgot this even happened. She never brought it up again. I hate to pull this card, but when I when I got the rice for the tribe, you won immunity. I, I got rice for the entire tribe yesterday by not playing immunity. You know, I was able to secure rice for the last 11 days. So I don't want to make a big deal. Yeah. Overall, I think Angelina's game was similar to players like Yule and Wendell's in that every interaction she had in the game was calculated to get votes. The only difference is that they were good at it and she just wasn't. Nevertheless, in a game full of shameless moves made to garner jury votes, Angelina getting rice for the tribe stands so tall amongst the rest, you'd need a 50 foot ladder to get up there. At number one is Chris's final tribal council speech in Survivor, Vanuatu. In the Hall of Jury Panderers, there is everyone else, and then there is Chris. Chris was a legendary BS artist who had this uncanny ability to tell everyone exactly what they wanted to hear and have them eat it out of the palm of his hand. And that is what he did in Survivor Vanuatu's final tribal council. You could put the entirety of his final tribal here, but it's his final speech where he goes down the line apologizing to each member of the jury. That's gotta be number one for me. Down the line, he speaks directly to each member of the jury and tells each of them exactly what they want to hear from him, no matter how contradictory it may be to the thing he just said before. Chad and Sarge, we're best friends in the game. I don't care how you vote. He knew how they'd vote. Amy and Leanne, I outfoxed you and you lost specifically because Twyla betrayed you. Eliza, I'm so, so sorry I gleefully screwed you over. I hope one day I can be as smart and as talented and as popular on TikTok as you. Julie, you're like my little sister. We'll be friends forever. I'm so sorry I betrayed you. Our relationship matters more in this game than anything else. And also, here's your hat back. And Scout, uh, fuck you. You're voting Twyla. Anyway, this whole thing is legendary. Chris did not mean a word he said, and what makes it even better is that this follows an incredibly sincere speech from Twyla, where she's on the verge of tears for what she's done in this game in the pursuit of money. Chris was on the verge of tears too. They were just... Crocodile tears. Got nothing else for ya. If you found that this video pandered to your interests, like and subscribe and I'll get you more Survivor content just like this. Until next time, don't get idled out.